Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms where I give you a heads up about upcoming shows and which date and time they will be aired. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the shows, MP3 files which you can download, or links to your favorite platform like iTunes, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and all other major sources. You can find information for upcoming and past talk show appearances as well as new book projects at MarlenePardo.com. You can also purchase books and merchandise there. And you can visit my author page on Amazon at Marlene Pardo Pelliser. Due to popular demand, I'm narrating my True Believer stories that I've collected throughout the years in a new series called Supernatural Storytime. You can find links at SupernaturalStoryTime.com. If you are into classic horror, ghosts, and adventure stories, I narrate some of those at Nightshade Diary. And you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If you would like to read noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, you can visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. I do want to thank you all for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. How is everybody doing today? Good, I hope. I'm doing good. Okay. No need. I'll repeat what I said last week in the middle. Earlobe deep in South Florida weather, which is rain, rain, and more rain. As a matter of fact, this show right now kind of had a hiccup because the thunderstorm. Of course, my lights, my electrical flickered and everything flickered with it. The computer. But anyway, guys, let me tell you um, about the guest that I have here tonight. Uh, this is a person, okay, and, and um, I know that a lot of you have been asking me, oh, that, you know, you, you, you like to speak to people that <clears throat> not only have experience in the paranormal or whatever, but the ones that have firsthand experience in the paranormal, uh, either mostly sometimes because they have psychic abilities. And as you know, you know, from a lot of the guests, sometimes... It starts when they're very young, okay? And sometimes it happens when they're an adult. Sometimes they, it happens as a consequence of an experience they had, had trauma, and sometimes they're just born with it. When, sometimes they even have that experience and they don't really understand what it is, especially if it's ha- happened to them as a kid. But uh, the guest that we have here tonight, his name is Robert Rigi. And course he's a psychic and a medium and you know that I've, I've told you that a psychic and a medium are two different things you can be psychic not necessarily a medium but he's both now he investigates both the paranormal and psychological aspects of each case that he deals with uh he has two master's degrees one in psychology and one in clinical social work and he has the skill sets it takes to delve into the world of the supernatural from exorcisms and possessions to stories of the otherworldly Robert never fails to capture your imagination and always leaves you wanting more. How are you doing today, Robert? Thank you, Marlene, for inviting me to be on air with you. And hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is having a fantastic evening. Um, I live in here in Peoria, Illinois, and uh, we've had horrible, horrible storms for the past three months. A lot okay. of flooding here and such like that. Um, but today, the sun is shining a bit humid. And we're yeah. going to be getting storm later tonight. Yeah. And yes, my um, my life within the paranormal started when I was very, very young. Okay. Um, I am half Italian and half Spanish, and so you know, Marlene, coming from that culture, mm-hmm. it's very spiritual culture. I am Roman Catholic, also, um, and so having that spirituality is just kind of like in my blood. Right. Right. But right. when I was four years old, when I was four years old, um, I had my first apparition. Wow. And it scared the crap out of me. Was it a stranger? It wasn't a family member or anything like that? 
No. Okay. It wasn't at all. It was someone that I didn't know. But this person came to me, and I had fallen asleep that night out on the sofa. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, and here comes that 3 o'clock, you know? Yes. Um, the bewitching hour is the day. Yes. And, um, and all at once, this person was standing in front of me, paralyzed. I was scared. I was four years old. Oh, my God. I didn't know. This, it was a gentleman, and he was very kind and very soft-spoken to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I was scared because all the ones I woke up thinking that someone was looking at me, and even at four years old, I could feel things like that. Right. Didn't understand it, of course. And when I opened my eyes, here this gentleman was standing in front of me, and like I said, he was very loving and very kind, and he whispered softly to me, and told me that everything was going to be okay, and that um, that he was sent to me um, to help and to guide me um, on my way through this paranormal or spiritual. And at four years old, everyone, I had no idea what paranormal I was about meant. to say, that's pretty heavy for a four-year-old. <laughs> yeah, God. Yeah. Ooh. You know, I was scared. I almost peed myself. And uh, <laughs> and I tried to call out for my mommy. And, and and I couldn't call for my mom. And I remember the gentleman, and his name was Lucas. He finally told me his name was Lucas. Okay. And, he, and Lucas calmed me down and, to, again, said, everything, was, everything will be fine. And I remember his parting words were, follow your spirit, follow your passion. I had no idea what spirit meant. Right. I had no, no idea what spirit meant. a four-year-old, you must have been. Right. L- L- looking <laughs> back again, do you think that, was he a guide, or was he just, was that a one-time thing that you saw him? I only saw him one time. Really? And But it was very loving. And, and, and you know, Marlene, as I thought about meeting Lucas over all these years, mm-hmm. that he is the truly one that got me started within the paranormal field. Now, one has to realize that I was born in 1954. Mm -hmm. So this was in 1958. And psychic mediums and the paranormal and tarot cards and things like that, one had to be very, very careful because our culture and our society um, played those off. And also, they believed at that time that it was a psychiatric disorder. Sure, yeah. And especially you know, if you're saying I you're seeing been, things and hearing things, oh yeah, yeah, right. And so they could have thought my family could have thought that I, you know, that I was schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. I'm having some emotional problems, and stuff. and um, so I remember when Lucas left, I felt, I felt like I said I felt very safe. I didn't understand what he had said to me, and I and when he left. And, you know, Marlene, when he left, there was an air about in the room that was so refreshing. I remember as a child, um, and even to this day, talking about it, Marlene, that I am back on that sofa in my little pajamas um, and reliving this. It's not often that I talk about Lucas. In fact, Marlene, you are one of the rare persons that I have even spoken to about Uh Lucas. Um, Thank you so much for, I mean, to, to, for bringing that up because, me. yeah, um, because sometimes, um, who knows if he was trying to head off you having maybe uh, another vision of maybe somebody else that was deceased that wanted desperately to connect with a, a boy that had psychic abilities and maybe somebody that looked really horrible or in a death state and he was trying to kind of like, you know, kind of like give you a heads up before you really right. saw something yes. frightening? Yeah, yes, very much so. <clears throat> and, you know, prior to that being four years old, Marlene, I didn't understand what I was feeling. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand that I was feeling other people's emotions. At four years old, you don't know what the word emotion means. Sure. But I remember that I was feeling sadness and joy from other people just walking by them when my mama would take me to the market, 
to church. Uh, we used to go to the cemeteries a lot. Being okay. Hispanic, being Italian, mm-hmm. you know, going to the cemeteries like going. To- right. So right. It, 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 people black, don't realize you know, it, that it, it's not considered a morbid thing. It's not. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very, it's very much so. It's like a, you know, it's like going to a family reunion. Right. And this one yeah. cemetery in Peoria, my great, great um, Italian grandparents are buried there. My mm-hmm. grandparents are buried there. A lot of my great aunts and uncles, Italian as well, Spanish, are buried there. And so we used to visit them all, and we used to talk to them. Right. You know, and when I went there, I remember that I felt different. But I kept these things deep inside of me. Okay. But my Italian Nona, my Italian grandmother knew that I was gifted, okay. but she did not know how to approach my parents about it. Yeah. Wow. And I remember one day being, you know, being at my Nona's house, and Nona in Italian means grandmother, mm-hmm. and she was such a loving, loving woman. Her name was Giovanna, and uh, God rest her soul. And um, we started to talk, and of course, She spoke in half English and half Italian, and Uh I knew even at that young age, because because that's what we spoke in the house, um, that she was going to tell me that I had these gifts and talents. Now, when I say gifts and talents, those are my words now, but she called it that I'm spiritual, you know? And she asked my mom if I could, if if she could take me to a friend of hers, what, what we would call now a white witch. Okay. Okay. And um, and my mother said yes, yeah. and my mother still didn't know what was going on, and neither did my father. Uh, <laughs> yeah, did. no, they're of course they're never thinking that a grandparents, you know. <laughs> yeah, I can see where yeah. they were like, okay, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yes, and but I did tell my mother. I never told my father for the longest time. But I did tell my mother about what I experienced that night. <clears throat> and she embraced it. She didn't tell me, oh, it was just a dream or anything like that. Right. Um, she engaged me. Instead of being pushed aside, mm-hmm. uh, because I am mentoring 10 children now who are so very gifted and talented within the paranormal field. Very, very gifted and, right. and talented. And a lot of these children that I am mentoring, they have been pushed aside by their parents until their parents reached out to me and understood that right. those children are not psychiatric and sick, right. that, they, that they are truly gifted and talented. So I'm meeting with these children um, at least once a month, especially during the spring and summer times. But anyhow, so then my Italian Nona takes me, and um, her name is Anastasia, and a very wonderful woman. She must have been 150 when I met her. I mean, she was very old, <laughs> and the minute that I walked and came into her front room, of course, there is juice out, there's water, there's milk, and, you know, being Hispanic and being Italian, uh-huh. everything surrounds the table, with food and everything. And so we sat down, and she says to me, and she could hardly speak English, but, but I remember that she told me that God has blessed me with so much and that I will help people in life, okay. and that to follow the spirit, follow my dream, follow my passion. Okay. And again, here I was four and a half months, and I had no idea what that really meant. Sure. And but she was setting the seed, like Lucas mm-hmm. was setting the seed in me, and to encourage me to to embrace these gifts and talents. And I remember that Anastasia, that she started to like what I thought it smelled terrible, but it was sage. Okay. As I look back now, it was sage that she put in the bowl. Mm-hmm. And I first thought it was incense, but it didn't smell sweet like that, you know? Right. And then she began to pray. And she was Catholic, like, you know, like I am. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was with her for about an hour and a half. And sometimes she would just look into my eyes like she was reading like going into the depths of my soul. Okay. But I felt very comfortable with her because I know my Nona would never put me in harm's way. Right, right, I knew right. that. Yeah. You know? and, um, and we were there for about an hour and a half, and I felt exhausted afterwards. 
I told my Nona, I said, it's time for a nap. I'm tired. <laughs> and uh, so went back to her home, went back to her home and I fell asleep on the sofa. And so that was my first experience. I only met Anastasia once. Okay. And then I never went back again. My opinion grandmother never took me back. Okay. Um, and then it just, and then, and then I started to mature, started to get older. Um, I went to a Catholic school. Okay. And it was during post communion. And, you know, you know, being Catholic, we go through the rite of first communion and confession mm-hmm. and confirmation and those types of things, you know. Right. And I, of course, I went to a town. I went to a Catholic school and we had like 14 nuns there. And most of the nuns were very loving. Other, other ones were just horrible. Yeah, I, I, anyhow, I, I, went, through, I went through 12 years of Catholic school and I, I know what you mean. But mine were Irish nuns that, that um, taught at my school. And I know what you mean. Um, Most of them were very nice, but some of those Irish nuns have a hot temper. And there was a couple that you'd be like, oh, I don't uh, want her for home. <laughs> they were brutal. And um, so first communion, and I was walking in line up to the, we had communion rails back then. Mm-hmm. And I remember Marlene and everyone who's listening, that all of went to Marlene, and right now I'm really, I'm reliving that this very moment all the ones I saw angels of Marlene wow. I saw the most and you know, I started to feel like I'm crying now because it was such a joyous time I saw these beautiful angels and they were following the priests okay and nudged my friend and next to me and I know that I wasn't supposed to talk out loud because the nuns would have slapped me down like a dog so I, <laughs> you know <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't know, I know, but it was just a wonderful, beautiful experience. And I remember when the priest gave me the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, the wafer, the, body, the true body um, of Christ, being Catholic, we believe that mm-hmm. that is the true body of Christ. Right. And the priest's hand turns into the angel's hand, and the angel was giving me the body of Christ. Wow. And Marlene, and when I, right now, I am reliving that. And again, Marlene, I have not told this to many people, wow. but my spirit today told me this is what I need to think about. And, and, and so I, the, the, the priest must have been thinking, why is he looking at me like that? <laughs> he, he had, did he have any idea that what <laughs> yeah. you were actually seeing, Robert? I guess not, huh? No, he, did, I, he didn't have a clue. I don't know. Wow. I don't know if he thought I was having the epileptic seizure <laughs> or what was going on with me. And I'm not making fun of like no, 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 no. But, but you know what? Just, I, 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 I totally understand what you were talking about. As far as people don't realize, back in those years, if you went to Catholic school, is very strict. I remember if I would forget my beanie, I would sweat bullets mm-hmm. if we had to go to mass because you were supposed to have your head covered. Mm-hmm. And and I understand when you were saying about like right. I couldn't. Right. I was seeing something, but I knew I had to, like, you know, act normal. Or if not, I was going to get in big trouble. I totally get right. it, believe me. Right. And it was difficult because here I was, like, six years old receiving yeah. communion. And again, um, and again, I was experiencing so much during that time. I didn't levitate or anything like <laughs> that. But the love of God that I felt and the angels. And the angel that I saw at my first Holy Communion is the angel that continues to be with me this day. Really? And it is Raphael, the okay. God's medicine to love. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so that's Raphael. I'm going to tell you, Marlene, and everyone, that I am adopted. Okay. And my birth name, which I did not know for later on in life, my birth name was Raphael. And really, and, wow. and so that makes sense, you know. And so Raphael has been with me all this time to guide me and to protect me. Of course, I did stupid things in my life. Oh, Everyone does. Everyone makes condition. bad decisions. But the thing is, it doesn't mean anything, you know. <clears throat> so, and so then it just got my my abilities became stronger and stronger. And I talked to my mother about it. Now, Italian fathers are different. 
you know, they're just like Hispanic fathers. You know, yeah. they're busy working and doing this and doing yeah. that. My father was my adopted father. He's the only father and mother that I know. Uh-huh. And they very loving to me, very loving. But I felt this closeness to my mother, uh-huh. okay? And, um, <clears throat> and so I would talk to her. I would talk to her about these things. And my mother would just pat me on the head and smile and kiss me. She uh-huh. called me her little bambino. And, um, um, and I haven't said those words in 40 or 50 years that I just said just now. And it just... And my mother passed away in 94. Wow. And like I said, my mother was very loving. And, and she encouraged me as much as what she understood herself. Right. Okay. Um, and so then during the grade school years, I was having a difficult time. In fact, I began to stutter terribly really? because I was being bombarded with all these spirits. Spirits in the classroom, spirits at the window, people beckoning me, oh, you know, people uh, wanting to talk to me. Right. Well, I was going to ask you what happened after you saw Lucas. And like you said, here you're, you know, you're growing up. You're still a child, though. Uh, and I'm thinking if you've got these abilities, you it's inevitable that you are going to have, I imagine, these spirits trying to communicate with you, you know, like elbow each other out of the way to speak to right. you. So that must have been for a little kid. That must have been tough. Oh, it was tough because Marlene and everyone who's listening is that I did not know who to go to. Yeah. I could go to my mother. I could go to my Italian grandmother, my Nona. Yeah. And, you know, and talk to her or about things, but it was something that I needed to experience on my journey. Mm-hmm. You know, we're all here on our own spiritual journey, not religious journey but a spiritual journey and I so I I began I began to stutter terribly my my grades began to falter because every time I sat down every time I walked by anyone I was I I would see I would see five six seven spirits and they would like they would talk to me in my ear and and I didn't know what to do and so when I was speaking to my mother and she goes, I, she goes, I am so worried about you because, because of your, because of your speech, because of you stuttering, mm-hmm. what's wrong? And I told my mother, okay. I said, mama, I, I said, mama, I see these spirits. I said, they're good spirits. They're just wandering around. They're lost. And I even saw a little little kids my age walking around asking me to help them oh, and marlene i did not know how to help them of course that, that is such that's that's you for know a, a, even for an adult for a child that's god that's such a heavy load it was it was so difficult and so my grades like i said began to falter sure. and I began to stutter even more terribly, mm-hmm. and then my and then we we had a young priest, a German priest came to our parish, okay, and he was co-pastor, assistant pastor, and and he took a liking to me, mm-hmm. and my mother was explaining to him what was going on with me, okay, and was a loving and kind man and I would talk to him of course with my mom being in the room of the things that I was experiencing instead of pushing me off and throwing me away and telling me to say 10 hail Marys and say our fathers and you know fast or whatever um, he was so loving and he is the one who really became my first spiritual director even at that young age, he was only at the parish for two years. But was... during those two years, Marlene, meeting with him weekly, um, I began, to, my grades uh, got better. Okay. My stuttering um, started to decline. Okay. And he made me feel so comfortable in what I was experiencing. He is the one, Marlene that his name was Fabian, the Fabian, and mm-hmm. God rest his soul. And Father Fabian taught me how to turn it on and off. 
Oh my, that's that. And I love your roosters in the I love your roosters in the background. I'm saying, I don't, you know what? Everybody, I, like I said, I don't hear them anymore because I spend all day. You know, the sun's coming up, and even sometimes they're like, ah, and after a while, but yeah, forget. Everybody knows that I have a lot of animals. I can't control animals, so it's like background. Yeah, and, uh, people. Some people have music. I have uh, farm animal noises. But anyway, continued. So luckily, by the way, you stumble across a, a priest who's like open-minded and realizes, you know, that this is a gift is what it sounds like. And he, I guess he taught you what boundaries, how that you could set up boundaries between yourself yeah, and these things on and off and how he did it. And I use the same method now as when I'm mentoring the children of the same normal. Okay. And he showed me, he picked up a book. Okay. And he said, Robert, when you, want, when you want to be with the Spirit, you open the book. And he said, when you don't want to be bothered with the Spirit, you close the book. And he said, it's going to take time for you to do it. Right. He said, but continuing, continue to do this. And Marlene, within a month or so, it started to happen. Okay. And so for a long time, Marlene, I closed the book. I, I didn't open it for a long time yeah. because my grades got better. My stuttering declined, stopped to almost nothing. Um, and so, and so Father Fabian was such a nice and loving man and taught me so much. And I did not know that at the time as being at that young age that I would be using the same method that he showed me to the children that I'm mentoring today. Right, yes. Marlene, I believe, I believe that God puts us, puts us where we need to be at any given time. And God put yeah. Father Fabian in my life. Yeah, like to a, exactly, like thing. a foreshadowing of what you were going to be able to yes. use that knowledge for. Not only for yourself at that time, yes. but of course, yes, I understand what you mean. So he, he was, he, he was, it sounds so like almost, what, weekly. so by the time you said he was there two years and he, I guess what, he got transferred out of the parish? Yes, yes, ma'am, he did. And I was heartbroken. Yes, my because God. Because he's the man, say. he's the priest that he could play for with anything and he understood. So after two and a half years, he was transferred and again, I truly believe now is that God put him in my midst because mm-hmm. I needed him the most during that time. Yes. And so I learned how to turn it on and off. And like I said, for many years, I closed the book um, because I needed to do things as a child. I needed to play in the mud. I needed to play, you know, sure. uh, forts and stuff like that. And needed to do things as a child. Mm-hmm. And there's so many children that the families have reached out to me that became very reclusive because yeah. these children did not know who to go to. Yes. They were afraid to go to their ch- uh, to their teacher. They were afraid to go to their pastor. They were afraid to go to their friends. Yes. So a lot of the children, before they met me, um, they became very reclusive. Their grades began to fall. Some of them had eating disorders. Wow. Uh, and such like that. But again, I believe that God puts us where we need to be at yes. any given time. Yes. And then in high school, and so I graduated from a Catholic grade school, mm-hmm. and I had the opportunity to continue my Catholic education, and I told my mama and papa, and I said, I want to go to a public school because I am so sheltered. Right. So sheltered in this Catholic school. Most of my relatives went there and the people in the neighborhood and in Peoria at that time, we had 15 Catholic grade schools here. Mm-hmm. And so my whole life was surrounded with Catholicism, and there's nothing wrong with that. But right. I wanted to see more of the world, yeah. you know. Um, and so I went to a public high school, which at first it was very difficult for me mm-hmm. uh, because being so regimented in a uh, Catholic school, school where you stood in line in a straight line and you did not talk and when somebody oh, yeah. entered the room you stood up oh my god yes oh you're system. one of those i tell everybody <laughs> nobody under you get 
<laughs> yes, man. If anybody came, you had to stand up and say good morning, good afternoon, whatever. I mean, that was, oh my God, yes. A Catholic school person. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, boy. And so going to a and going to a public school and going to mass every day. Yes. I got and I served me, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and which was very important to me. But then in high school I decided I decided, like I said, to go to a public high school and I did. And and the first F word that I ever heard in my life, I didn't know what it meant because I was so <laughs> sheltered in this Catholic yeah. school. Yeah. You know? And so I went home and asked my father I said, what does this word mean? Oh, 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 he said in Italian, he said, never say that around ladies. Never say that. She goes, it's the nastiest word. Never say that in front of your mother. Never. And so I didn't speak. But, but still, I never knew what the word meant. Right. All I knew. My- right. Yes. No, people don't understand word. that, that, you know. It's, especially nowadays, I think sometimes people might find that hard to believe, Robert, what you're describing. But yes, in uh-huh. Catholic schools, and I know because I had friends that went to public school. As a matter of fact, I lived very close to a public school. And of course, like you said, when I graduated in eighth grade, which was when you would go, I wanted to go to public school because I didn't want to wear a uniform anymore. <laughs> My mom said, nah, you're going to stay in the uniform thing. But people don't realize Mm -hmm. that absolutely right. They, you know, you, there was no type of foul language at all that was tolerated while you were in Catholic school. Not even the... In the face. And one time I remember in fourth grade, she said, Robert, you are insolent. Yes. And I said, sister, I have no idea what that word means. And then she slapped me again. Oh, my <laughs> God. Let me tell you something. I tell everybody. I remember that it must have been like seventh or eighth grade. And mm-hmm. uh, my second grade teacher was Sister Regina. Check it out. Sister Regina also taught choir in about seventh or eighth grade. Of course, you know, this is adolescence, you know, when everybody starts acting. We had this guy named Greg. Nice guy. We had all like started all together. And she was, mm-hmm. you know, like telling him something, you did this wrong, something. And all he did was roll his eyes. Oh, crap. <laughs> she slapped him. She goes, how dare you raise your eyes to heaven? And everybody in the, in the class is going, huh? You know, she lost it on him. <laughs> and you know what? He bowed his head and he's like, I'm sorry, sister. And that was it. It was like, what? People... <laughs> Catholic school stories. <laughs> so we're gonna have to do another show about that, Robert. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so, but I learned so much. It's very true. I learned so much at the Catholic school. I learned respect. Yeah. I learned discipline. Uh-huh. You know, um, and, and now in now in schools, unfortunately, that yeah. discipline is not cool. and respect to each other. I mean, excuse me, to be respectful of each other is not a, not taught in schools either and that's why i think that our school system here in the united states is so yeah. it's, it's so upside down yeah, and all the hate is. and all the evil and stuff yeah and so then i went to went to a public high school and i enjoyed it thoroughly i really did mm-hmm. and but during this time i decided to open the book now it's been many years since i opened the book and i opened the book but it was different this time you know how Father Fabian would teach me how to open and close the book, and the mm-hmm. spirits were there with us. It, like, now being a teenager, and I think you know, being hormonal, yeah, yeah, roller coaster and such like that. That mm-hmm. the experience of the uh, of the spirits were different. Um, they would beckon me even more to help them, and Father Fabian did, you know, did instruct me in how to and how to help the spirits who continue to wander on this earth. Okay. He taught me how he taught me how to show them the light. He said, Robert, the light comes within you. You show them your light. And the light that you show them that will help them on their journey to heaven. And I remember those things. Okay. Like I do and it's been you know you know, this year I'll be sixty five years old, so we're talking about 50 some years ago now okay. and I still remember those things mm-hmm. and so in high school I opened the book up like I said and spirits came to me and now now I began to see things psychically 
besides people talking to me that, you know, um, that spirits who have passed talking to me, now I started to see things psychically. And again, and that was different for me. But I embraced it um, because I truly believe that the gifts and talents that I have and so many other folks have, they're truly gifts and talents from God that we are created for a specific reason with these talents and gifts to help other people. Mm-hmm. At that time in grade school and in high school, but now I do. And so opening the book in high school and beginning and knowing what Father Fabian had taught me to help these wandering souls to right. follow the light right. and the light comes within me. And so that's what I started to do. Now I didn't open the book often okay, because I wanted to experience things help. And, um, and, and, and I knew that if I would open the book all the time, that I would be, I would be consumed with it. Right. And I did not want to be, I wanted to help people, help the spirits, yes. Right. Uh, but I needed to be, I needed to experience life. Yeah, you were a live human being. And having all this, yes, and having this death around me all the time is not good for anyone emotionally. No. Um, physically or spiritually. Mm-mm. You know, it's not. It is not. And also, and also there is that opportunity, Father Fabian said, Robert, you always have have to be careful of the evil one mm-hmm. because the evil one lives. He said, if you look at, and he wrote out the word evil, and then if you look at the word, it really, and then it's, it's lies, mm-hmm. E-V-I-L-L-I-V-E, right. and he said, evil does live, and he said, you have to be very careful. He said, ask Jesus to cover you with his, with his white light of love and protection. Anytime you open the book, you cover yourself with, with the love of Jesus, and that will protect you. He said, pray to St. Michael the Archangel. Pray to, your, to, your, to my own angel, Raphael, and I have. From the moment that Raphael came into my life, he has been with me. I talk to him at times I see him. He's always there for me, always. And so in high school, like I said, I opened the book sometimes, and then maybe for like an hour or so, and then I would close it because I wanted to go play tennis, I wanted to drive my car, yeah, I wanted to go to Burger King, yeah. McDonald's, you know, I wanted to go bowling. Of course, people back then bowled a lot back then. Yeah, in the 70s. <laughs> it was. And, you know, and, go to, and go to baseball games and really live, live my life as a teenager here in America. Right. And um, so I... So I closed it more often than I opened it. And then I graduated from public high school. And I have always felt compassion for for poor people. I felt compassion for those who are handicapped. And I told and I talked to my parents about that I wanted to go to school to become a psychologist okay. or a clinical social worker so I could help other people. All right. My mother knew I loved to cook. Being raised in an Italian and in a Hispanic family, cooking is number one. Always around the table, always eating, yeah. laughter, you know, such like that. And my parents really wanted me to go to the Chicago culinary uh, program there. Um, it was called the Cordon Bleu at the time. Okay. And they were going to pay me, and you know, they were going to pay my tuition. And I said, but I really want to become a psychologist. I want to understand the human mind. I want to understand, I, I want to understand why we do the things that we do. And so my parents agreed. They said, where do you want to go? And I said, I said, I want to go out of state. Because if I don't go out of state, I don't want to live. I mean, I love being here in Illinois, and I love my family. I have 72, at the time, I had 72 first Italian cousins. And so family, as you know, modern being Hispanic, family is everything. Yes, yes, but you know what? I'm going to stop you here, Robert, because it's really funny, because now we hear the opposite. 
we hear about people's kids that are in their 30s and they still don't want to leave. Like they, they're like the opposite. You know, they, they don't want yeah. to, they're almost like afraid of experiencing life. And back then it was like, okay, I, I mean, I want to do stuff. Yeah, my, I might be difficult, but okay, I can handle it. I, I don't know what happened between now and then, to be honest with you. But mm -hmm. no, it's very true because, and they said, where did you want to go? And my mama goes, you know that I will miss you, my bambino. And I am. Um, and so I cried. And I said, please, mama. I said, I have to. I want to experience, I want to experience everything that I can. Right. I said, I love Illinois. But I said, there's a, there, there's a vast world out there mm -hmm. that is beckoning me. And so please let me go. Oh, let me go. It's not that I don't love both of you. I love you so dearly, and I thank you for adopting me when I was just six months old. And, um, and so my mom and dad talked about it, and I remember the next day my father goes, you can go to school wherever you want to go. And, you know, that we were not, I was not raised in a very wealthy family. Mm -hmm. My father was a, was a blue-collar worker. He was a caterpillar, mm -hmm. okay? Right. And money was great, but I never knew poverty. If we, if I was poor, I didn't know what it was. Right, you know? exactly. Because exactly. everybody else in the you know, that we were in the same boat, as they yeah. say. Yeah, And so my father said, where did you want to go to school? I said, I want to go to the University of Florida. Okay. And he goes, why so far away? And I said, I don't know. My spirit just says, go, you know, and she said, your spirit. Now, my mother had talked to my father about some things, but not everything. Okay. And so my mom, my mom understood what I was saying. And so they talked a little more and they said, fine. And I said, when I graduate, the next day, I want to go to the University of Florida because if I don't go, I will never leave Illinois. I said, I have to go right afterwards. And they wanted me to stay here in Illinois for the summer and work right. and stuff like that. But I knew that if I would have, I would have never left. Mm -hmm. And then I would have never been, I would have never been able to fulfill the destiny that God had, that God had set out for me. Right. And so, so the next day they put me on a plane and here I am, a Hispanic, Italian, gay Catholic boy going to, going to North Florida, as they say, to Gainesville. And I had never truly been to the South before. Mm -hmm. And so it was culturally shocking <laughs> to me and different. <laughs> um, and, and, but, but all in all, my experience at the University of Florida, it opened so many avenues for me. Mm -hmm. Of course, I parted like everybody else would do, you know. Right. And so I needed to experience that too. Um, met some wonderful, wonderful friends that I'm still friends with to this very day. And, but I realized that when someone, and I think this is probably, probably at every college and university, if you're not from the area and you come there not speaking with an accent and maybe you dress a bit differently yeah. and you speak a little differently, um, it is sometimes people shy away. But I got with some good friends who were into psychology and social work also. Okay. And so but they were from the east, uh, from the northeast, from like Boston and New York and places like that. Okay. And so we just had like our group of friends and, um, but my experience at the University of Florida in Gainesville, it was an eye opener. It truly was. Okay. I remember one time I went to, um, St. Augustine. Okay. Because I heard how haunted it was. Yes. And so I opened the book. I opened the book and I had told my friend that I have these psychic gifts and talent and some of them understood it and others didn't and that's fine and that's fine um of course everyone says well do a reading on me can you read my future i said well if i can read the future we would go and we would go to the horse track and we would, <laughs> yeah, you know we, you know we would be 
<laughs> right, right, and exactly. People so don't we understand went, it doesn't work like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then I went to um, St. Augustine to the fort. And right. wow, my experience was unbelievable. I saw apparition spirits of soldiers. Okay. And then I saw people with the spirits that were like in the dungeons and, you know, in the jail there and such like that. Wow. I would hear things. I would hear things. And the spirits would talk to me. And, and, and you know, sometimes people saw my hair being ruffled and they were wondering, well, it's not windy, what's going on? And so yeah. I would explain to them what, you know, some of them were scared because they did not <laughs> yeah. want to, you know, and they, you know, they were okay with me, with my gifts and talent, but they were not really into it themselves, you know, and that's fine. And I, and I appreciate that. And I truly respect that. And I said, don't worry, everyone's protected. And um, and so internally, um, interiorly, that I prayed for each of them that God would protect them with His white light and love. And so going to St. Augustine was unbelievable. We were there for three days. I didn't want to leave. Yeah, not but it's, it's not only like the fort; it's that whole area right there. St. Augustine has quite a history. The the that little, especially that little historical area that's adjacent yeah. to the fort. Yeah, a lot of stuff happened there. Mm hmm. And I felt so comfortable there. It was like it was like I was home. And so we were there for three days. And of course, we went to the ocean and such, and had a wonderful time. We went to the beach, mm -hmm. and then I found out about this other little town close to um, the land and New Smyrna Beach. Yes. And um, and it was called Casa Dega. Yes, Casa Dega, absolutely. Yes. Do you Spiritu know where that is? Yes, I've been there very a lot of times. Spiritualist. Oh, yes. Oh, it's the spiritualist camp. Mm -hmm. And Marlene, let me tell you that when once and I went there, it was a Saturday, and it's very green there. They have a lot of tall trees and green and everything. Mm -hmm. But there was no there were no children outside. There were no dogs outside. It was eerily quiet. It was crazy to me. It was. I, During that time, I did not open the book because I did not know. I knew it was a spiritualist camp. Right. I understood that. But I just needed not to open the book because I didn't think it was safe for me to do so. Yeah, well, and so all, that, we yeah, they're, to, they, they're kind of very also particular. I mean, they allow, you You know, you just can't move there. They kind of like control who actually lives there as far as that you have to be a medium or a psychic. So, Right. Oh, they're a very close community. Yeah. Yes. And we went to a cafe there at the time and went into the cafe and um, they asked me where we were from and said Gainesville students and such. And um, one older gentleman, very, very old, very nice gentleman, and he was eating by himself and I invited him to come over and join us. And again, I was following my spirit. Mm -hmm. And over all these many years, my friend, that I have always followed what some people would say, gut, you know, your gut feeling. Right. And so I followed my spirit. My spirit says, ask this gentleman to come over and eat with you. He is alone. And so the gentleman came over and ate with us. We sat and talked for over three hours. It was wonderful. He was originally from New York. And okay. had come to Casadega because um, because of his gifts and talent. Oh, okay, okay. So he lived there. And yes, he lived there. Yes. And he asked me if if you know how long we were going to stay, and I said just for the day. He said, "Do you want to go to some cemeteries and some places that I can take you that the normal visitor or passerby would not know or go to?" Mm-hmm. And again, like you said, Marlene, it is a great community. It's crazy. I mean, that's the word I can say. It's just, yeah. you know, you know that when you don't see any animals, I didn't, and and also I never heard any birds there either. And when you see and when you see no children, right. nobody was in their yard at all. They were all inside. Right. It was just. It was just. 
Yeah. It was just creepy to me. But I learned so much from this gentleman. Um, and everyone that I was with, my friends, were just fascinated, fascinated with his stories. I bet. And now this gentleman has passed away. God rest his soul. But going to Casa Dega, and uh, like I said, we were there for the day. And then we went back to Gainesville. And then right before, I was in, I was in Gainesville for uh, almost six years, and that's because I wanted to do more of the forensics and psychology, mm-hmm. and um, and also the clinical work within clinical social work. Right. And um, so I was there for a bit longer. Right. Well, six months into the program, um, I was asked by the dean of psychology department or the chair of the department if I would be interested in going and interviewing. Ted Bundy. Oh, you're kidding. Ted Bundy. Oh, oh, oh. Mm-hmm. And you did? My spirit, my spirit leaped, left. It leaped. It was like, oh my gosh, what an experience, you know? And he said, Robert, it's going to be you and five other students um, that have that have the experience within the realm of psychology. Um, it's not, not to go there to have fun it's not there to go to look at a circus freak. But I. But he said, I want all of you to experience what a serial killer looks like. Psychopath. Yes. And so we did. And so wow. that's a whole other story. That, that must have go, been like... I did go there. That, that, and you know that not too long... Well, but recently, as a matter of fact, they put out that I think it's on Netflix uh, about about like a series about Ted Bundy and, you know, uh-huh. how engaging or normal yeah. looking he was and that that's probably why he was able to lure so many of his victims. Oh, he was. He was, he was, he was. Yes, Marlene, he was very charismatic. Mm-hmm. But when he looked at you, there was there were uh, three gentlemen. And there were two ladies, two two female students, students that went with us. Right. And he he focused on the female students, of course. Right. And when it was my turn, and we had certain questions we could ask, and certain right. questions that we could not ask, and such. Mm-hmm. But when it was my turn, he looked at me, and when I looked into his eyes, nothing but pure evil. Right, and he looked at me, and he knew. He looked at me and said, "Robert, I know who you are, and I know what you can do." Oh, now how did he know that? Well, and but I looked into his eyes. Pure evil. There was nothing but pure evil in those eyes. My hair started to raise on my arm. Let me ask you, Robert. Do you think? That considering what he did, and 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 I, from what I understand, there's still victims that they think that he never claimed, or that they've never been able to link to him, but they suspect that, or even have been found. In other words, do you think that the, he ha, he was uh, right. either yeah. at an attachment yeah. or had some level of demonic possession? That that's why not only did he do the things he did, and don't get me wrong, I totally understand that people can do horrific things and not necessarily, you know, that devil made me do it you know alibi doesn't hold water right. but because of that comment he made to you that's very unusual that he said that to you yes it is because he did, yes because he did not say that to the other students mm-hmm. at all yeah. in fact then that the professor that went with us was shocked that he said that because this professor did not know of my gifts and talents either right exactly. some of the students did but the professor didn't and and the professor looked bewildered. He thought that maybe I had I had written to Mr. Bundy uh, before we had gone there, but I never did because right. we were asking to, and right. I didn't. And he wanted, he and afterwards he had, he asked me, um, why did why did Bundy say what he did? Right. And we were with a group of people, other people. And I said, I will talk to you later. And so I did. So finally, I did come out to him. 
you know, here I came out gay once and now I have to come out of the closet being a psychic medium, you know? <laughs> it's like um, and so um, <laughs> and so um and so, and so telling him but the professor was very open to that. Okay. Very open. Okay. He said but, you know, he said, Robert he said, Robert, there are possibilities in this world. I I have to validate in what you said and what you have experienced in your life. And he said, Robert, when you, if you ever, and he used the word paranormal, and so this is in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So again, that word wasn't used to me. No, it wasn't. And he goes, Robert, if you, if you ever start investigating, doing whatever within the paranormal field, always validate what the people are experiencing is true right. because it is their perception exactly. and not ours. Yes. And who lived with me for it. Right. And I also must tell you that there is a connection of Ted Bundy and Pure, Illinois. Oh, In yeah. fact, right down the road, four houses from me, there was a young girl who went to the same public high school that I did, mm -hmm. but she was she was six years older than me. Okay. So I was in grade school, but I remember her. She decided during the time in the 70s, like oh, everyone else, it was a hippie thing in the 70s, 60s and 70s. Everyone, everyone was hitchhiking. Going well, I was about to say, don't tell country. me hitchhiking. That You look at it now and you're like, man, they're crazy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> she decided to go hitchhiking to the Pacific Northwest. Oh. And during that time, also there was there was a serial killer called the Green River. Yes, yes, serial killer. Gary Ridgeway, right? Okay. And, but she, yeah, but she met up with Ted Bundy, a girl that I had known not very really well because she was much older right, than me. Right, right. But but I know who she was. Her parents and my parents went bowling together and such like that. So we were all mm -hmm. good neighbor, neighbors. And I really like I said, I just know her that well. But, um, um, and, uh, but yeah, he had, she was hitchhiking. She was almost, almost to, um, almost to Seattle. Right. And she was hitchhiking. And who picked her up? The Ted Bundy. Wow. And he mutilated her. He masturbated on top of her. He cut her breasts. He burned her. Oh. He dismembered her. He put her in a he put her in a garbage bag and traveled from that part of the Pacific Northwest all the way to Texas with her. Dead in his in his back of his car. And he buried her in a shallow grave under a pecan tree in Texas. And how I know all this mm -hmm. is that I met I met this young girl's brother many years later, and he told me he told me about that because he had heard from my parents that I had met Ted Bundy, and so he wanted to re relate that story. So to was me. this something they did? They ever recover her remains? Was this something that he talked to the police mm -hmm. about, or did they discover her remains and didn't know who she was? Um, the parents went down, and because of DNA, you know, you have to realize that when I first got in the field, that we knew of DNA, yes, mm -hmm. but there was no testing for DNA. Right, right. The testing of DNA came in the last, it, had, it started in 1982. They really uh, tweaked the, the last part of 1982 and in 1983. Right, and it, was not, so it wasn't common DNA, at all. Yeah, so, so through DNA then, they decided that it was their daughter, his sister, that was murdered by Chad Bundy. Yeah. So let me ask you, that, I, I maybe did they did he confess, and that's how they found her, or was were her remains recovered, and they just didn't know who it was originally? You know, in other words, they, they yeah. didn't connect her to him. How how did they realize who right. she was? Besides right. the DNA stuff, I mean, or right. It was during the time. It was right before he was uh, when he was executed. Okay. That he began to sing like a canary. Oh, okay, and okay. He okay. wanted, and part of it, and so part of it, he wanted to get out of prison. He wanted to see the, you know, he wanted to right. be out about 
So right. he thought in his he thought in his mind, well, you know, well this, you know, you know, I will be able to go out right. of the prison if I start talking and everything. So did. So they took him to many, many places, and one of the places was Texas, and he showed them where the grave was. Right. But he said in the very last. But I remember when I when we were about ready to leave, mm-hmm. he turned around. But prior to that, let me tell you that he addressed the he addressed the female students with his eyes. He kept talking about their breath. Oh, my oh God. you have beautiful breath. Are you oh, serious? You He's telling breath. them this during this interview? Oh yes. I got oh, well, what has he got to yes. lose? I mean, what's yes. gonna happen? <laughs> right. And but when he looked at me again, his eyes that gaze, I will never forget it. It was it it truly, truly evil. Do I believe that he was demon possessed? I believe that there is a fine line between mm-hmm. a psychiatric disorder right. and being the right. And I think and I think that there was a part of him that was truly demonic. Right. Okay. Was he psychiatrically ill? Yes. Do I believe do I believe that he was born psychiatrically ill? Probably so. But there were things that happened during his during his childhood. I think yeah, that yeah. sent him over before, you know, right. um, and so did I do did, did I think to this day that an exorcism would have worked possibly. Well, but and, again, and then you think, and then you think to yourself, though, he had a good, very good grip of reality, it sounds like. And he knew the difference between right and wrong, because how long was he able to do all these things? And he knew he had to right. cover his tracks, in other words. It's not like right. somebody that's so and, out of touch you know, with the reality the that time. they uh, they they do something and they just you know like you hear sometimes horrific murders that that somebody that's very deeply right. disturbed or you know has a very uh, you know their mental illness is like oh, oh, in other words they're they're totally out of touch with reality but he I mean he cut, killed right. so many women and made sure yeah. to cover his tracks so. Yeah, no, he's mm-hmm. very intelligent also mm-hmm. from what I During understand. What happened, oh, yes, very narcissistic, very intelligent. He was a lawyer, very smart man, very charismatic, very good-looking man. He could charm anyone, and he did to their demise. Yeah. yeah. And I remember, I remember that reading his life afterwards, mm-hmm. that there was a time when the person who, the female who raised him, right. all the time, he thought it was his sister, but it was his mother. Really? Yes. Wow. And when he finally told him, and prior to that, he was functioning pretty well, pretty normal, let's say. Okay. Whatever. Okay. Okay. But when she told him that, that's when he started to go off the deep end. That's when he started not to trust women. That's when he started to hate women. And that's when he started his, as he would call it sometimes, his revenge against the bitches. Wow, but you know, but God, that's that's still, that psychopathic streak. That's, I mean, I, yeah. could, I could see where maybe, you know, a a man could have a very complicated relationship with women because of that. I get it, mm-hmm. but between that and what he did, wow! And he does have he does have one daughter. He I did father a daughter. I did not know that. Yes, and the daughter does not go by his last name. Can you blame her? He has never surfaced. It came out in a trial prior to him being sentenced that he does have a daughter. And he said, and he agreed, yes, that he did, that he, yeah, that he did, but she has never surfaced. Yeah. She doesn't go by his last name at all whatsoever. And I wouldn't either. You know what I mean? I wouldn't. I, mean, she, I, wouldn't. You know? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Well, I mean, and, even uh, now, so, um, uh, Manson, he has, uh, 
he has grandchildren and everything now that you know they've acknowledged so the relationship and Charlie Manson is another, well Charlie Manson is another one that fascinated me and also John Wayne Gay yes you see here in Illinois mm-hmm and also the BTK killer yeah. in Wichita, Kansas. That fine torture kill guy, he's a... Now, Ted Bundy... Yeah. Now, Ted Bundy and the guy in Wichita, mm -hmm. very, very, very narcissistic. And as we know, the narcissism will come back and kick them in the butt because they begin to get sloppy yeah. because the narcissism will pay for them you know what? You got away with a one. Come on, you can do it again. We can do it again. Yeah, and you're smarter. I'm smarter and than you. And what happened else. to the people? Yes. And then what happened to um, the uh, the guy in Wichita? He was silent for years. Mm -hmm. And then one day, and then this gentleman, not gentleman, this beast, to the animal that I'm talking about, the guy from Wichita. Right. He. He was he was he was an elder in the Lutheran Church. Yes. He was a good father, a good grandfather, and whatever. Yeah. You know. Perfect citizen. And one day one day Yes. And one day he said he was just sitting there in his chair and, and what I would say his narcissism came back and I think he had stopped that for a long time, but it came back a zillion fold and said, You know what? You got away with so much you can get away with it again. Yeah. And, but this time, by the grace of God, that he was very sloppy, and yeah. that's how he was caught. Right, because he didn't understand when he used uh, and a case, floppy disk on the computer that that could be traced. He was not that up and up on, or computer savvy to understand that yeah. stuff like that could be traced. And Marlene, do you remember Scott Peterson? Yes, of course. Uh, the husband who killed Lacey, Lacey yes. and the husband child. Yes. And they were and they were in California. Yes. I have been writing to over all these years during his trial mm -hmm. because he fascinated me. And in the letters that I have gotten from him, I receive a letter once a month. Okay. He still he still possesses his love for his wife and for his child and that he never, that he never murdered them at all. And that he wishes that he would get out. They would allow him to get out of prison <clears throat> so he would be able to find their killer. He is so narcissistic and so out of touch with reality. You know what? I think so that people... For him, you know what? I, I think the thing is, Robert, people sometimes confuse somebody that's vain versus somebody that's a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Because you can have, you know, you know, you can be conceited right. and be, you know, vain and stuff like that. But that's, it's only superficial. How's that? Versus a true narcissist. Yes. Is, uh, which. Because narcissistic tendency is so ingrained in your personality. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, someone, someone can say, oh, well, look at my hair today. Well, that's just being vain, and that's fine, okay? Right. Yeah. But a true narcissist is, is so ingrained into their psyche, into their bio biology, into yes. themselves. Yeah. And Scott Peterson was, was the golden boy of his family. He could do no wrong, nothing. Whatever Scott did as a child, it was wonderful. They got him out of so many scrapes. Right. So many things, mm -hmm. but even to this day, the family does not believe that they that they had anything to do. Of course, they didn't have anything to do with the murder of Lacey and their child. But it's just a fact that they, to this day, do not believe how that was raised had anything to do with the murder of Lacey. Which, and I disagree with that. Which kind of totally. tells you a you lot. Know? Uh, and and mm -hmm. to me, what I remember, you know, I didn't. I followed the trial, but I really didn't file it. I mean, like on a day-to-day -day basis, but I remember there was one point where when he was involved with his mistress, Amber, I can't remember her last name, he's telling her that his wife is deceased. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, come on. I mean, I know married men will lie if they're having, you know, an affair. Uh, mm -hmm. They, they'll, you know, they'll say they'll divorce or separate, not even married. But that thing about my wife is dead, that's... Very right. unusual, mm -hmm. kind of like a foreshadowing. Like, was he thinking already? Um, 
Right. And in his mind, all this time, that Lacey was dead to him. Right. She was dead to him because she was pregnant. Yes. He never wanted her to be pregnant. Right. Never. Yes. And so from the time of her pregnancy, the time she got pregnant is when he turned on her right. and became dead in his mind. Right. So I continue to write to, to Scott. I don't, I don't comment about how I feel mm-hmm. about the trial and anything like that. I keep it very, very super, not superficial, but I just ask him how he's doing and right. if he's going through treatment and such like that and what is it being, you know, and, you know, so he tells me about death row and such like that. And some people think that it's really macabre that I do this, mm-hmm. but I am fascinated with the human condition. I truly am. And I think that, and I think I'm fascinated with that because of being a psychic medium mm-hmm. also. Right. You know, um, do I believe that Scott was possessed? No, I do not. Right. I just believe that he was so, he was so psychiatrically sick. And then his narcissism had taken over that the world, as we know, narcissists believe that the world revolves right. around yeah. him instead of him revolving That's, around the right. world. And they're, they're very much into control. And yeah, maybe I'll that control. part, like what you said, you know, he, he controlled her. But when she went and she got pregnant, probably I, whether it was accidental or knowing that he didn't want it, but she did, maybe that for him was like something he couldn't control that that they're very much into control right and, you know right and you know but also is that then this baby became her number one priority of not Scott. he lost the spotlight there or was going to lose it very shortly mm-hmm. no so so my journey within the paranormal field has been an extensive um when I graduated with a master's degree in forensic psychology and clinical mm-hmm. social work from the University of Florida, I became a criminal profiler first in Orlando. Okay. And then I, was, then I was transferred to beautiful South Beach, Miami area. Yeah, we talked about that. God, God knows there's a lot of people here to profile. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I have seen it. You know what? Every, like all major cities, it has its underbelly. And yeah. And, and so my so my spiritual journey within the paranormal field has been vast, and I have I've been involved in two exorcisms, like you said, mm-hmm. I'm sanctioned by the Roman Diocese of Chicago, and maybe sometime we can talk about that. Um, I volunteer at a hospice who ministers to children, and I go into their homes. Um, I get a call maybe just hours before they leave this earthly dimension. Right. And I assist the children. And the children will talk to me about angels and seeing angels. Okay. And I'm just not there for the parents, but I'm also there for the parents. And sure. maybe sometime we can talk about that. And mentoring these 10 children, in which I will call children of the paranormal. Mm-hmm. These children are beautiful. They were so misunderstood growing up. And they couldn't reach out to anyone. And I do a lot of radio programs. Mm -hmm. And so their parents have heard me on different programs and such. I always give my phone number out. I'm always available. And so they reached out to me. And so my experience with the parent in the field is vast. And I love it because I am doing what God has destined me to do right and, and we and are you, spiritual and you, beings you know that. And you feel it in your heart when you're like doing the you know what what they call your passion you know you're you're living your passion yeah. that is very very true it is very true and and like i said maybe sometime when you have availability that i will you know i We'll have the privilege to come back. Oh, absolutely! And we can talk Robert. about other things. Yes, I, I, I would like I to hear about fun. your. I want to call them your adventures in South Florida. Um, you know, we talked briefly before we started recording that here in South Florida, it's uh, mm-hmm. it's kind of a very diversified cultural area as far as not only the people that live here, but their belief systems, things that happen. Uh, yeah. Right. 
Like I'll play the I know, um, I know one thing, Marlene. I'm sorry, what? I, um, I know that I was working, I was working on a case that that I had I had to get involved in Santeria. Yes, yes. And that's that's well that's one of the and aspects so here that yeah, that, that things can get very dark. I hate to say it, but very, very dark. Yes. Oh, very much so, yes. And so I've seen the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. Mm-hmm. A criminal profiler becomes the victim. We become, we, we, we find out what they eat, where they eat it at, what they, uh, where they buy their clothes, where they go to church, who are their friends, and such like that. What kind of movies do they go to? So we become the victim. Yeah. And that's how we find who, uh, who the murderer is. And more times than not, as you know, it's going to be a family member, it's going to be an acquaintance and stuff right. like that. It's very, very seldom that you're going to, that a person is going to be murdered like a, by a Ted Bundy. Okay? Right, right. And as a matter um, of fact, they say sometimes that's why those crimes are so difficult, those stranger on stranger, because that's it, you know, when there's right. no connection, you know, for law enforcement to look at. And either the person mm-hmm. has left the area. I mean, there's no, you know, where does it go? It's not a neighbor. It's not a family member. It's not a, you know, a boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, a lover's thing. So that's that's why, um, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you heard about this. I'm going to change real quick topic. Uh, about a couple of months ago, January, out of, well, this he's incarcerated in California now uh, because he killed three prostitutes. But... He's, I guess, you know, when you got nothing to lose, you know, he's got uh, life sentences. Plus, he's already an older man. He's like in his 70s. He's mm-hmm. been killing women mostly since the 1970s. And he's... I think I heard about him on TV just recently. God, I, I could, I, I can't remember his name right this second. And as a matter of fact, a bunch of police departments from across the country have gone over there with their cold case files hoping to identify, you know, some of these cold, cold cases. And right. they, I, the last time I checked, I think that they had been able to match um, him to certain victims, about 15 of them. Some victims, they had the name. Some victims, they didn't even have the name. In other words, these were remains that they were never even mm-hmm. able to identify. Unfortunately, right. many of them, not all of them. He did kill some mm-hmm. women that, uh, had no risky behavior or you know lifestyle, no drug, no prostitution, but most of them were. So that's why it was also difficult sometimes to even identify them. But yeah, he he's cut a swath of you know killing uh, across. I want to say he even killed somebody here in Florida, woman up in Florida and northern Florida, and yeah, he went through the states and. Yeah, uh, I mean, as far mm-hmm. as people, yeah, the majority of times I think it's usually we look at it, it's close close to the victim, but man, the, when those killers that they just, uh, you know, the opportunity presents itself and they really have no connection whatsoever to that victim. And then... Mm-hmm. It's true. It's, um, it's just like, so, um, so, so it's just like in the 50s, 60s and 70s where people were hitchhiking. Yeah. It was a spirit of love and free love and all this stuff. People were trusting people, yes. you know, and no, no one thought that no, they were going to be murdered and such like that. Yeah. And that was the opportune time for serial killers, yeah. such as Ted Bundy and the Green River murderers, um, mm-hmm. to do what they did. Um, because anybody would get into a car hitchhiking, yeah. you know, see somebody hitchhiking, pick them up. Yeah. We didn't know if, you know, and now as we think about it, the person who's hopping in the car, are they going to be killing the motorist or the motorist going to end up killing Right, yeah. right, yeah, because you know? it, can, it can go both um, ways. So it, it was, it's not necessarily the hitchhiker who could end up yeah. being the victim. People don't right. realize oh, it could work the other, yeah. the other way. And, um, well, and also, when I was in school, we studied um, about Ed Gein. Oh, man. Do you Let know me that tell you name? something. That's a real cuckoo bird there, right there. I'm sorry, but God, he, whoa. Yeah. yeah. Yes, he was, and so we studied, and we studied about him. Um, fascinating. I mean, I do not condone what he did and how he did it and such, but there there are specific reasons 
what led him to do that, and maybe we can talk about that sure. at a different time. Yeah. And yes, again, absolutely. I'm not justifying what he did. In yes, you know? I would love to bring um, you back, Robert, so we can talk thing. about you know all these uh, about yourself, your abilities, all these cases. Uh, you've been so interesting to talk to. Let me ask you, Robert, yeah, if um, yeah, people you. wanted to reach out to yes. you, what's the best way? Do you have a phone number, how, or a website, or Facebook? How can they find you? Okay, yeah. I'll give you my number. Okay. Uh, 309 213 0325. I live in Peoria, Illinois, Central Standard Time. If anyone has any questions, okay. um, if, they, um, if they need my assistance, I do so much within the, uh, within the paranormal field. In fact, tonight I'm talking uh, with my friend Michelle, mm-hmm. who has reached out to me, who has taken care of of her son who was in a horrible diving accident and she was having a most difficult time through the grieving process. Okay. And she heard me on a mobile program that I did, touched by an angel.net okay. and talking about angels and then talking to children. But anyhow, so I, I will be talking to Michelle tonight. Okay. Um, and, 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 and I will put, anyhow, I will put your phone number, to... Robert, in the credits of the show. Also besides, you know, for anybody. Okay. They can find it there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And also, there's someone wants to go to my Facebook page. Yes. I don't have a website. I did, but someone hacked into it. You, you know how those pesky spirits can be at times. Yes. I Anyhow, it's called so Paranormal that Sabotage. That's my, ne- that's my yeah, word for it. Yeah, very much so. Yes, I totally understand. <laughs> and so someone wants to go to, to, my, to my Facebook page. And my profile picture is not there. It is going to be of a little boy. Okay. And I will talk about him sometime. Okay. That I was with him to assist him in his journey to heaven. Okay. All right. So I want to thank you. No, I want thank to thank you, you Megan, so very, very much. No, thank you, Robert. Have a wonderful day, and good luck to you on all your projects and all your endeavors. Thank you so much, and we will talk soon. God bless everyone, and remember to give each other a hug. You know, love prevails over hate. Yes. And if someone's having a bad time, look inside of you. And we all need to live. We all need to love the little child inside of us. Yes. Embrace that child. Love that child. And in loving that child, and then you will feel the love as an adult. Yes. God bless everyone, and thank you again, Marley. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Oh, wow. You know I'm going to have Robert back. (laughs) I mean, that goes without saying. He is a, well, he's very kind-hearted, very knowledgeable. Um, I, 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 yeah, like I say, I could spend hours and hours talking to him, but definitely I got to, I got to bring him back. I got to bring him back. It's just... So, you know, we'll, we'll be hearing more from Robert, uh, again, uh, in, uh, in case you, if you didn't catch his phone number, even though it will be, uh, in the credits of the show. All right. His phone number is 309-213-0325. Okay. And if you go to Facebook, all you need to do is look for Robert Rigi, R-I-G-H-I. Uh, and I'll, of course, all that information if you have the credits. But in case you're listening to the podcast version, this is how you can find Robert. Uh, as you can tell, um, you know he's he has his the psychic abilities, but then he also has the training, the education, and I think that's really important because I understand that very well myself because of my own. Uh, my background in edu, you know, as far as how I was educated in mental health, uh, that sometimes, you know, people do have mental illnesses that have nothing to do with the paranormal. They don't. I've said it before. Sometimes you do have both things. Sometimes you do have somebody with a mental illness that has an overlap of supernatural events taking place around them, or in some cases affecting their behavior or making it worse that's possible and then you have the other spectrum which is you have people that are having 
a paranormal slash supernatural event and they're kind of people try to diagnose some of the mental illness when it's not a mental illness you know when there is nothing wrong with their brain they're truly experiencing like what he was describing as a child hearing things seeing things feelings that you're like am i going crazy you know that 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 part of you that that questions your own sanity and then of course if you think you could question your own sanity what, what do you think happens um when you come in contact with people around you uh and as he was saying even kids nowadays you know if they have any type of psychic abilities you know everybody's different some some have maybe are clairvoyant player audience uh they're sensitive i mean it could be everything it could be one or the other and you know everybody thinks well so cool now but for a kid that's really getting this with no control over how to stop it or slow it down it can be overwhelming they don't see the cool aspect of it in other words they don't because like he says and people don't realize you know especially if you are able to see or hear and you know the let's say you have metamystic abilities as far as dead people they're not going by the clock okay they're they're not saying oh it's 11 p.m. or midnight and bobby's got to sleep no 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 they don't want to crowd and communicate because they are aware that this person this child whatever this teenager can see hear them you know and they're just they bring with them whatever they got if they they were angry if they were hurt if they were sick uh they they you know they pile on to this person and so you if you get a kid that doesn't know that wasn't taught like he explained what that father did for him how to turn it off uh it it can be overwhelming so of course you know um you get the kids that withdraw that become isolated and i've said this before for all human beings but especially for a teenager um that's not good and he made a very good point he said it when i went into high school i didn't open that book why because normally what teenagers are doing whether you're an introvert or an extrovert you want to you want to have fun or you want to like transition between you know adolescence teenager into becoming an adult you know there's a lot of experiences uh so less you don't want to be uh hearing a dead guy talking in your ear or some lady trying to show you something you know and you could tell you know you're dead and uh, whatever this is like these years it, at the same time your kinetic energy is so high at that time and spiky that it's almost like you're an agent which of course that's you hear a lot of the poltergeist stories how there's usually some type of adolescent uh in the household that is might be the agent for the poltergeist activity because of that so yeah you know that he works with that people don't realize that again thanks hollywood having those abilities when you're a kid because it's really funny you you don't want to be the odd man out and you know for all that at that age you want to be different or do your own thing you still don't want to stick out and besides maybe getting visited or sensing or knowing things that you're just not ready for like in other words all you want to do is you want to go to school and hang out with your friends and have a good time and uh you know uh romance you know stuff like that you know the stuff that's normal for that age it kind of gets sidelined totally so the fact that he's helping kids with that that says a lot that says that that's very important okay and that could be probably a big determining factor what kind of life they're going to have as an adult okay because if you can show them how to basically close the book like what he did and then be able to handle whatever ability they have at the time and in the degree that they want but that they have control over it that they can like turn it off turn it on quiet it or you know and and i think that there's even people out there you know kids that at the end of the day they don't want to have it 
And I know a lot of people go, what? Yeah. And, you know, I see it personally as being psychic or having, you know, the ability to be a medium as a gift. But everybody's different. And I think that there's humans out there that do have this ability and they just don't want to use it. They, they do not want to be one smidgen sensitive because it's just whether they haven't had one bad experience or it's just that. And I'm not even talking about here about religious upbringing or nothing. I'm just talking about their personality. They don't want to have it. There is nothing in it for them, even though it's a part of them. And that ability is theirs, inherently theirs. They don't want to use it. They want to like not lower the volume or or close the book. They want to close the book, burn it, bury it, throw it in the ocean. They, they just, just, they don't want to at all. And that's the kind of thing you have to respect uh, as far as choices that people make about their abilities. Um, again, uh, I think personally, to me, the best thing is being able to enjoy it, but having control over like what Robert described, how he was instructed by this father on, uh, on something so it doesn't overwhelm and basically wreck your life because that can happen. The flip side of it is for those people that have no way or nobody teaches them, a lot of them, believe it or not, do end up declared insane or um, abusing drugs or substances because they just want to quiet their voices down they just do not they want to shut this down and sometimes they turn to drugs self-medication alcohol there's nobody's ever showed them this is how you shut this down okay and in some cases if it gets really extreme they get diagnosed with mental illness and get treatment with drugs and that's and it's like yeah they're being treated but it's the symptoms, it's not the cause. The cause is something where this person basically has been bombarded and they just have not learned that they can. First of all, they have the ability to say, I don't want to hear you. And you just can't barge in and throw your 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 story or your because this is and this is something really important and I love that Robert pointed this out. Because, and I've talked about it before, you will have a lot of psychics and mediums especially who only want to go for the, oh, it's, it's, everything is good and butterflies and little blue birds. And I say, what is swirling around a psychic are earthbound spirits. Like he said, like what, how this priest showed him you know, you find the light within yourself to guide them into the light. Why? Because these spirits, these human souls were earthbound, trapped or confused or whatever. But they were bound. They were confused. They So this is what swirls around when a psychic or medium opens themselves up. These are the ones that I want to dogpile on and say, hey, 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 uh, uh, what happened? nobody hears me nobody sees me or oh my god you know uh i feel really sick uh, uh, you know or or some you will you know the suicides the 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 ones that are confused the ones that can't kind of remember like uh you know i i i'm lost everybody's got their story or, you know, whatever the case might be. There's all these spirits that are not bound to the haunted house where they lived or whatever, where they died. That they're free floaters. And when they identify that person that they know can hear, see them, feel them. They, I hate to say it. They don't care if it's a child. And... um. They, they, they overwhelm you, okay? And then there's a lot of uh, people that don't realize that, you know, and again, I go to this, when you do this work, okay, uh, those, 
those and which I mean we could do another show about this which is why people that cautionary tale about Ouija boards or spirit communication etc etc because this is what is around there this is when you open up and you're trying to communicate okay and like he said he and he's and he Robert he described that the priest also cautioned him about evil and about asking for protection. Why? Because in and amongst the spirits of human beings are things that are not human, or in some cases, uh, let's say, uh, let's use Ted Bundy. I'm not saying Ted Bundy's ghost, but somebody that was a Ted Bundy, as in psychopathic, no empathy for other human beings. There's a lot of people that are born that way that doesn't necessarily mean they went around killing people but they didn't have any empathy for other human beings they were very controlling and sometimes they die and then well eventually we all die but and some of them get stuck in that death state and they're as a ghost they are exactly who they were in life and maybe Part of the reason why they're stuck is they didn't think that there was an afterlife. More than likely not. You know, in other words, they 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 weren't that much into spirituality or what happens to you uh, as far as your soul. They really thought that when you died, you died and that was it. Maybe they were hedonists, lived for the moment. Uh, that was part of their emotional makeup. And then here they are, dead. And it's like, what now? And then... They still have that psychopathic streak in them. Yeah, so again, when you open yourself up for communication with them, this is what's out there. This is what's out there. And by this, again, it's it's almost like, think of it, it's not good or bad. Let's let's take the, the non-human entities out of this equation. It's just like when you go out in the world, you're going to go run across nice people, you're going to run across people that are okay. There's, you know, in other words, people that are into themselves. It's just everything. It's the same thing. If you take all these different possibilities of human beings that cross your path and you take them and you throw them into the non-human, now they're dead. More than likely, I hate to say it, your lighter, airier, good feeling people that have love, they usually, they don't, they don't get stuck. They don't, they just don't get stuck. They just make their way. They transition. It's the ones that the the ones that have that experience uh, or emotions of hate, anger, revenge, uh, all those really heavy feelings. Those are the ones that get stuck, and those are the ones that are uh, out there uh, that will most definitely answer the call when anybody uh, is trying to either open some type of communication, whether it's a Ouija board or any other method. And God knows there's a lot of people out there that don't know how to protect themselves. And then there's the other ones that, of course, are looking for a Robert, a child, or, you know, to to intrude and hope that's, that, that, that they can get their message across or that they'll get an explanation or answers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it's... it's you know, again, it's complicated, simple, but more complicated sometimes than what you see in a lot of reality shows. So again, guys, thank you very much for being part of my audience. Uh, I have a lot of interesting guests coming up. And like I said, I'm hoping that, uh, no, I'm not, I'm, I am I know I'm going to extend the invitation to Robert and I'm hoping that he will be able to come back shortly and we can talk s- some more about his experiences, uh, both as a medium and in the field of the paranormal. And uh, take care.